so the session this evening is going to look at the FA's misconduct process and disciplinary hearings. Um, what I would say is, by all means, as we go through the presentation, feel free to drop questions in the chat. Um, or if you'd like to, you can um, raise a hand um, through Microsoft Teams and uh, can then come to you so you can ask any questions that you may have at that time. The session this evening uh, is broken down. It's it's down as um, five sections to it, but actually I'm, I'm hoping it won't be quite that onerous. But I, I always feel that um, the disciplinary process is such a such a meaty and sensitive topic and it's something that comes with a fair amount of impact for clubs both into and individuals both in terms of reputational impact financial uh, sporting sanctions and suspensions and there's an awful lot of language and um, scope for confusion in the FA regulations so it helps to kind of go through those underlying principles that guide the disciplinary process and then some of the regulations that kind of give us the authority as the county FA to take the action that we do. And then going to look at what that process actually looks like in reality when a report comes through to us um, to the point that a charge is, is raised. I've got a practical demonstration just in terms of where you can find that information on the whole game system, where you can go in and respond to a charge and access any information that may have been used um, as evidence. And then I'll touch on what a disciplinary hearing looks like. I'd probably anticipate as it is quite a full agenda, it will take us the full hour. Um, but like I said, it's such a it's such a crucial part of the um, the county FA machinery um, that I. I do want to go into it in a little bit of detail um, just so that everybody is aware of all those kind of regulations and procedures that are in place. As I said, feel free to stop me as we go along. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that may crop up. So I'm going to start just with the IFA's um, underlying principles when it comes to um, their disciplinary processes. So the five uh, key points that have come up on the screen now are the fundamental principles, um, which really inform and um, lead the decision making processes. So chief among them and probably at, and reason why it's at the top of the wheel there is around fairness. Um, and this really means fairness to all parties. So certainly we try to make sure that um, our processes are fair to the individuals that um, may have submitted the reports and may have been victims of a disciplinary offence, but also that it is fair to the person that has been charged and that everybody's aware how and why we're taking the actions that we are. Next then is consistency, and that is trying to make sure there's a consistency in it, both in approach, um, in how as a county FA we look into incidents and we investigate, consistency in the types of charges and situations where we will raise formal misconduct charges and then consistency in sanctions um, which runs across the entire FA through uh, guidance that is given to disciplinary panels nationally it means that you know that um, an equivalent offence in Barks and Bucks is not going to be disproportionately um, sanctioned versus the equivalent offence in Northumberland let's say you know where we may be handing out five game bans uh, here up uh, in another county, they're not just going to be um, issuing a, a general warning. Equally, if a decision is uh, found proven and uh, sanctions are issued, they need to be proportionate for the offence. So um, a, a more minor uh, verbal infraction, uh, swearing at a referee shouldn't be, um, shouldn't carry the same weight as an act of assault, let's say, because they are clearly two different levels of offences. That ties then into appropriate sanctions, that they are both um, proportionate, but sanctions should also be appropriate for an individual's role. Uh, one of the key ones we would look at there would be, for example, if a referee were to get charged, their sanction should not necessarily be a match-based sanction because that may be, um, you know, referees may be doing multiple games in any given day on any given weekend. A two-match ban to a referee could be served on a Saturday morning um, whereas a two-match ban for a player may would normally take two weeks to be served. And finally, we look to do an education program, and that, that includes not only potentially issuing education requirements as part of a disciplinary outcome, 
but also that underlying principle that we have a responsibility to educate our clubs as to what our processes are. So certainly evenings such as this, uh, some of the other education sessions we've run um, over the last few years are really about that, trying to make sure that uh, those people taking part in the game and the volunteers who give up their time to, to run football and to make everything work are aware of uh, what is happening behind the scenes at the county. So again, within that underlying principle, a uh, key one um, is also around timeliness. And that is making sure that when we take action, we do so effectively in a, and predominantly in a timely manner. We want to make sure that if someone is being sanctioned for an incident that's occurred on the football field, that actually that uh, sanction is happening in a timely manner. It's not something that's dragging out for six months and actually they're serving a, a suspension for an offence they committed months ago, during which time they've had the opportunity to commit further offences, let's say, or if you're looking at a um, high level player or a high skilled player, they, um, they're not benefiting their club or we're not helping their club out by making sure that they are not serving a suspension promptly, uh, which could then impact that team's ability in the league. So under the regulations, as a county FA, we have to raise a charge within 90 days of the incident being reported to us. And we have up to 180 days then to resolve that case. Now, these are very much the higher end of the scale here. Um, we have up to 90 days to charge and up to 180 days to resolve a case. And we would hope we would never actually get anywhere near that kind of level, particularly I would say that 90 day to charge. Generally, we, um, we try to make sure that we, we are turning these cases over quickly because of the impact it has on clubs, uh, participants and on the leagues. Generally, over the last couple of years, we have been um, the average length of time it takes us to raise a charge from an incident being reported to us uh, stands at about 10 days, um, which I believe is, is appropriate. Um, the majority will probably go out or we aim to get the vast majority out within a five working days of it being reported to us. So you look at your Saturday football, Saturday or Sunday football, we want to make sure a charge is out by that Friday. However, there will be some which involve a little bit more investigation, um, a little bit more of consideration or collaboration with other counties or with the FA before we can raise a charge. So um, that's why we have that very much internal target of raising charges within 10 days of, them being, of an incident being reported to us. Equally for resolution, while we may be getting towards that 180 day uh, limit for some of the cases that happened at the tail end of the 2019-20 season, because we couldn't hear them obviously throughout the first lockdown, during regular work and during the regular season and under normal circumstances, we're resolving cases pretty much within 28 days of the incident being reported to us. Um, so hopefully that gives an, uh, an understanding about what sort of timeframes we're looking at. Incident happens and you should know within a month um, what the kind of sanctions are going to be imposed for that incident. We then actually have priority cases, which we're required under FA regulations to hear within 28 days. Um, so those cases are where there's an immediate sanction um, because of uh, suspensions had to be issued because of the severity of the case. Also applies for cases of playing under suspension or where a match has been abandoned, because again, we appreciate that there is a uh, an imp a massive impact on the competition because they have to wait until we've taken action before the league can take action and get over the outcome of the game. So we make sure those are turned around within 28 days. So as I said, the key for this, those that timeliness is around the impact on competition and those serious offences. And the final principle there about where timeliness is, is particularly important is where young players are involved. And that is really because for, for younger players, for for children, for teenagers, you need to be able to associate the the cause and the effect. Um, the, it's been shown through various studies and through various research that the longer you wait to impose a punishment for um, against a child for some kind of act that they've done wrong, uh, the less they associate the punishment with that initial offence. So therefore, again, as long if we can try and turn around some of those cases that may involve 13 or 14 year old players and make sure that a um, a penalty is imposed upon them within three or four weeks of the offence taking place, it helps 
modify that behavior and uh, reinforce to them that that, um, that action or those words, whatever it was, the offense that they committed was not appropriate. So we're going to come on to the regulations that underpin um, the action that we take at the county FA. Um, I'm not going to go through all of it, don't worry, because um, text is on the page, but generally um, there's three or four key regulations that give us at the county the authority that we have to, to take action when an incident of misconduct occurs and to fine and, and suspend players. So the first is the underlying principle that the association, which is the FA, can act against a participant if they're deemed to have breached effectively the laws of the game and the FA and the various uh, governing bodies, both at a local and at a national level. And a participant then is deemed to be, um, oh, sorry, I must skip that one. Participant is deemed to be anybody that is involved in um, affiliated football. So that would include players, obviously, but it also includes match officials, club officials, league officials, county FA staff are deemed to be participants by virtue of our employment. So anybody effectively involved in the FA structure um, and taking part in football that is affiliated or sanctioned under the FA is deemed to be a participant. Effectively, the one group it does not include are passive spectators, so people that have no um, kind of active role in a football club. So E31 then is the key regulation that dictates or governs the behaviour that's expected of individuals participating in the game. So participants shall at all times act in the best interest of the game, shall not act in any manner which is improper or use any one or combination of violent conduct, foul play, threatening, abusive, indecent or insulting language or behaviour. A couple of key areas to pull out there. Participant, as I said before, is that uh, definition I gave earlier. So uh, there it is on the screen now. Um, as I said, pretty much covers every individual and every group that is involved in uh, FA affiliated football. And at all times. So at all times means that actually as a county FA and a, as the FA, we have the ability and the authority if we believe it's appropriate to raise charges for um, actions which may not take place at a football match. Um, the participant is acting as a participant at all times, and this is what gives us the authority, let's say, if there has been a social media breach, something posted on Facebook or Twitter relating to football, which is clearly inappropriate. Um, a participant is still a participant. It doesn't start and end at the, at the kickoff and at the final whistle. We will only kind of um, invoke that power outside of a football match when it is appropriate. Clearly, if a grassroots football player gets into some kind of incident um, out on the street, which has absolutely nothing to do with football, um, it probably wouldn't be appropriate for us to step in. However, let's say that, I'll go in the social media example, but also let's say that two players from clubs, um, from two different clubs, had had an incident at a football match on a Saturday uh, morning. And then we get a report that actually they um, bumped into each other in town later on that evening and had got into a massive fight again, where still the basis of that fight was the incident that had occurred in the football game. We may look at taking action then because we could say that their behaviour was inappropriate and was still relating to their involvement in football. As I said, these are kind of exceptional circumstances. The other one that I wanted to draw attention to uh, is FA Rule E20, and this is the regulation that covers the behaviour expected of clubs and organisations. So it states that every affiliated association, such as the county FA, every competition and every club is effectively responsible for ensuring that its own members conduct themselves in an orderly manner at all times. So um, those of you involved with clubs will know, you may well have seen these charges and they can relate to um, where, or most likely relate to if there is a mass confrontation of players in a game, uh, multiple people involved in a single incident, or where spectators have um, seriously misbehaved and committed um, an act of misconduct, or where there has been continuing misconduct throughout the course of the season. Each one of those would be deemed that the club has failed to ensure that it's kept its 
Um, it fails to ensure that its players and its members have behaved themselves appropriately. Therefore, as the county FA, we may take action against them. Just to clarify again, that does include all persons purporting to be its supporters. Final couple of regulations that I want to draw on. Um, these are ones which you would never see referenced in any kind of charge letter, but I just wanted to kind of touch on them because it shows how as the county FA we have the authority to do this. So G1, um, any misconduct under rule E is dealt with by the association or an affiliated association on its behalf. So we had delegated that authority by the FA to take action on their behalf. And then G3B, a competition shall not act before the association or affiliated association acts. So that just means that where there is a um, is a serious incident, let's say um, the match has been abandoned or where a player may well have played whilst under suspension, it's the county FA's responsibility to investigate and act first. And it's only after the county has concluded its, um, its processes that the league would then step in and make a decision um, from a competition point of view. So I'm going to touch just on what that misconduct process looks like for when a report is made um, and talk around what kind of thinking goes through our heads here at the county FA. So the report will always, or uh, the process will always start with a report coming through to us. By and large, for match-based incidents, these are going to be reports submitted to us by the referee through the whole game system. But this can also include where complaints are made um, by one club, perhaps against another, um, and it gets emailed through to us at the county. Any kind of report that comes into us um, still constitutes a report and uh, will always be looked at and will always be considered. It doesn't have to go through the formal referee process in order for us to, uh, to take action and to deem it worthy of further investigation. Once we have it, we will review it and we will determine whether there is any further investigation that's needed. Now, this may be that we need a bit of additional information from the referee, particularly um, if there's certain aspects of their report that we feel um, is missing in information or we just want a bit of extra clarification on. Um, and then we will, or we may contact the clubs and individuals involved for what we call their observations. And that is just to understand from them what they, um, their um, their account of the incident as it occurred. We don't um, have to take observations ad in advance of the charge being raised. Um, it really depends on the circumstances of the case. What we always call our uh, quote bread and butter cases, which is probably a horrible term to use, but um, those cases that kind of fill the majority of our work, uh, which may be abusive language towards a referee. So players maybe been sent off and decides to tell the referee what he or she thinks of that decision. In those kind of cases, it's unlikely that we would go to that player or to the club um, for their observations because we have a, a clear and concise and appropriate report from the referee. And so we have enough prima facie evidence that the incidents occurred and we can raise a charge. If, however, it's a slightly more complicated case, so one where perhaps there was a, a mass confrontation between players um, and a large scale incident, then we will contact both clubs involved because we want to make sure we understand what sparked that incident. And if there were any um, anything that occurred in that mass melee, which the referee may well have missed, that actually we need to take further action on. So once we've completed that investigation process, we will then raise a charge. Now, our threshold in the office to raise a charge is that we have sufficient evidence that the incident may have happened. We are um, we we don't take the charge and decision lightly. Um, we shouldn't be charging something if we have doubts that it occurred. But equally, we may well and quite often are in cases where we have quite a bit of evidence that it did happen, and then quite a lot of uh, evidence in advance of the charge uh, denying that the the incident may even have happened. So sometimes we will be balancing that and we will be saying, OK, if we've got multiple accounts that supports that this incident happened, um, that is enough for us to charge because sometimes you do they get those cases of um, he said, she said, and that um, the two different clubs or the two different parties involved may be offering conflicting evidence against each other. And if you're looking at it from a, an investigative point of view, if someone is 
aware that they are being accused of an act, um, they may they have a vested interest in trying to raise confusion in that. So if we are in a position where we've got multiple accounts in support of an incident happening, we will likely go ahead and raise a charge for it. Once the charge has been raised, it all goes through on the whole game system and the club will be notified immediately that a charge has been raised. And I'll kind of show you how uh, those notifications go through and where to check them on the whole game system in a little while. Just so you're aware, if uh, reports come through from an incident that involves uh, a club from another county or where there is potentially uh, racist, homophobic or other discriminatory language that's been used, we coordinate with um, our neighbouring counties or with the FA on those at the investigation stage, just to make sure that everybody involved in the process is aware of all evidence, um, that there's not been information that's gone to, let's say, our, our um, partners at the Oxfordshire FA that hasn't come through to us, um, but could obviously impact a charging decision. Um, and for aggravated cases, um, we have to keep the FA inv all informed along the whole process. Uh, so they're aware of, of the accusation and our decision making process as and when it, um, we decide to charge or not. So I'm just gonna to touch on the most common types of charges that will be raised. So when we kind of refer to certain incidents or um, events, you will have an understanding of the kind of, um, the kind of situations we'll be looking at. Now, unfortunately, the most common types of offenses and the bogs we deal with are still committed against referees. Although um, when you consider that the majority of player on player offences are dealt with through the match uh, disciplinary process of yellow and red cards, uh, that may make more sense that it tends to be where the frustration is directed at the referee, that it comes through um, the misconduct process. So the most common uh, offences then against match officials will be abusive language or behaviour, threatening language or behaviour, and then either physical contact or assault on a match official. Now, those bottom two offences um, are amongst the most serious ones we will deal with. And as soon as a charge is raised on those, the individual that's charged with that offence will be immediately suspended from all football, pending the outcome of the case. As soon as those charges are raised, we also um, must conclude the process within 28 days. That's deemed to be a fair amount of time, considering the, um, the severity of the accusation or the severity of the offence but also then the liability that if the player is found not proven, we're not actually keeping them out of the game for too long, ultimately unnecessarily, if they're found uh, not to have committed that offence. So we're kind of trying to balance up that fairness for all parties, fairness to the referee to make sure that someone that they've reported as committing physical um, offence against them is taken out of the game immediately, fairness to the alleged offenders that they're not kept out of the game if, it's, um, if that charge is not supported ultimately. So offences then not on match officials um, would be general improper conduct, um, and I'll come back to that one probably at the end. General foul and abusive language that may be um, committed by a player towards another player or by a coach towards another coach. Threatening behaviour, again, between players or between coaches. Violent conduct. Um, this is violent conduct that is not dealt with through a red card. So that may well be where a player commits violent conduct having already been sent off or commits violent conduct after the game or where it's committed by um, a club official. Uh, and then assault participant on participant, which again leads to an immediate uh, suspension as soon as that charge is raised or where we feel the existing sanction for a dismissal is clearly insufficient. Those are very rare and the guidance from the FA is very much that it shouldn't be a it should only be used in exceptional circumstances. So not as an excuse to review a normal red card, but only where we feel it's clearly inappropriate that a normal uh, one, two or three match ban wouldn't be sufficient. The general improper conduct uh, relates to that um, phrase that you may well have seen when we looked at the, uh, the regulation wording earlier on about bringing the game into disrepute. So this could be uh, general poor behaviour or where we most like most commonly raise a charge under that um, that category is actually if um, a, an individual or a club withdraws their players from the field of play, um, thereby causing the abandonment. Now, this is something which always um, 
is a difficult charge to raise um, and it's one where um, we, we take on a lot of heat, which I completely understand quite often where we do raise those charges. So an incident where we might look at raising a charge for bringing the game into disrepute would be if um, you've got a youth match going on and the referee deems that the match is still safe to continue, but one of the coaches feels that he doesn't want his players to continue anymore. So that may well be because of the weather or it may be because of the conduct of the other team. Ultimately, the referee is responsible for making that decision as to whether the game should continue. If a manager disagrees with that, they are actually going against the authority of the referee and therefore they are the ones um, who have chosen to abandon the fixture and are deemed to have brought the game into disrepute. So you can see why it's such a sensitive topic because the coach will be acting in what he believes he or she may believe is in the best interest of their players and um, and therefore they need to be aware that if they do make that decision there is a high probability that they will still receive a charge for actually acting improperly in that. Moving on to the club charges, um, these are the ones that fall very much within E20, so where a club has failed to ensure that its players, officials or spectators conduct themselves in an orderly manner. As I mentioned before, these can be for single incidents, so a mass confrontation, say, let's say, or by sustained abusive comments by spectators, or it may be for continued misconduct over the course of the season. And I touched on that um, at another session we did similar to this um, about a month ago, which is available on YouTube if you'd like a bit more information on that. Just going to touch quickly on charges for playing under suspension. Um, if we have evidence that a player has violated a suspension order, uh, whether that is for a longer term or serious misconduct offence, or just from picking up a red card the week before, then both the club and the player will be charged um, under FA Rule E10 and 12, uh, which basically states that they failed to comply with the decision of the association. Um, those are get those a few times a season. Um, the key thing to mention on those is that um, that charge will be raised whether or not you've received notice from us of the red card. Um, it's not, or it's deemed to be the club's responsibility to ensure that you know who has been sent off from one week to the next and what the terms of their suspension are. If a suspension is not shown on full time or whole game or the referee to the county in time that is not deemed to be a legitimate excuse for playing a player whilst under suspension um, so that's why it's really important that you stay on top of the disciplinary paperwork um, and particularly stay on top of any red cards that may be issued week to week again go into that in a lot more detail um, within the the last uh, support session we did a month ago and again, as I mentioned before, these must be resolved within 28 days of being reported to the county FA. And we do that to make sure that uh, the competitions are then able to make a timely decision around whether the points from that game should be awarded or uh, forfeited. Just going to touch briefly on a couple of uh, variations on the charges. They're terminology that thankfully are rare. Um, but useful just to be aware of in case you hear that phrase crop up from time to time. First is aggravated charge. So again, I'm going to just show you what the uh, regulation states, which is a breach of FA Rule E3-1, which is that behaviour expected of every individual involved in the game, um, is considered to be an aggravated breach when it includes reference to a protected characteristic under uh, discrimination law. So when, um, if a comment is not, and it falls as a comment, if a comment's reported to us that we feel is um, offensive and intended to be abusive and makes reference to a player's ethnic origin, color, race, nationality, religion, gender, gender reassignment, sexual orientation or disability, it falls under this category of aggravated charge. This, um, the same process throughout the investigation, although we do coordinate with the FA throughout, um, and it is one of the cases where you will receive full written reasons once a decision is made on that case. 
reason for that is because of the uh, sensitivity of the kind of offence, but also the profile that these have within football. It's not a case of asking if a comment is necessarily racist or homophobic or sexist in and of itself. It's whether that comment is includes a reference to one of those characteristics, which is a bit of a nuance, I appreciate, but um, it it's falls short of the FA making an assessment on an individual's character with purely looking at the nature of that comment. If that charge is raised, uh, it falls under two parts. The first is that we have to be um, satisfied that the language was foul and abusive. Um, and then the second part of the charge is whether it is aggravated. The other type of charge I was going to look at is alternate charges. And these are when uh, serious level offences are raised. So those um, charges for physical contact or assault on a match official or assault on another player. Um, when we believe one of those um, thresholds cases has been met, we have the option if we choose to raise an alternate charge with it. The higher charge, so the assault charge, let's say, will always be considered first. And if that's proven, then the, the panel continue to consider any sanctions based on that higher charge. However, if that uh, the, the conditions of that higher charge are deemed not to have been met by the panel, they can still consider the alternate, which would be a lower but a similar charge. So the uh, types that we would do would be if a player is charged with assaulting another player, the threshold for assault is um, an act that causes serious bodily harm to the opposition player. Uh, we would raise an alternative of misconduct so that if the panel decide that actually the, the injury sustained doesn't constitute, quote, serious bodily harm, they can still take action against that individual for the severity um, of their actions or for their actions, but of the lower severity. So we deem it to be violent conduct as opposed to technically assault. And uh, there you go, you can see kind of the primary charges and the alternates that we would raise. Um, I'm just going to jump onto the whole game system now just to show you if a charge does get raised against your club where you can find the information. Uh, hopefully you can see um, the login page at the moment for the whole game um, or that main dashboard that you will see as and when you sign into um, to the system. You should always land on this main club dashboard or main individual dashboard which will tell you if you've got any notifications and if you click through um, on this, you'll see that it will give you some information around what has been raised to. In this instance, I can see that a misconduct case gives the reference there has been added to our demo club. Always recommend once you've actually gone through and taken action on a notification uh, to mark it as red. That way, next time you go onto that main dashboard, it will have disappeared. Um, so you're always only look dealing with current cases. Uh, or current invoices equally. Um, if you do want to go back and find old um, notifications at any time, you just have to click on the all button and it will give you the full catalog. To find the case information then, uh, come onto the club dashboard and from here go into the discipline tab. And you'll be able to see in my list of current cases here, um, we have an active case against BBFA Demo Adult Male is the offender. Um, from a match, BBFA Demo Club Men versus BBFA Demo Club Greens in the BBFA Demo League. Uh, spot a trend here. Um, to get the full details of the case, um, click onto the case ID. And this will tell me uh, the information around it. So it gives me the name of the player, uh, date of birth and the offence. So in this case, it is improper conduct against a match official, including physical contact and threatening and abusive language or behavior. Gives me the date of the offense, which was Saturday, and it tells me when I have to respond to this case. It will always show an outstanding balance to begin with of 15 pounds, which is for the administration fee, but that would only become payable at the point that the case has been considered. Moving down gives me some information around the sanction, which tells me that player has been suspended immediately. Again, that's only because of the severity of the charge. 
um, if it was, let's say, abusive language, something that doesn't carry an immediate suspension, uh, then that section wouldn't show any details. And then uh, down here in the public notes, it gives you our kind of formal language that accompanies the charge that explains what it is they're alleged to have done. Um, the, the evidence is attached and we're trying to put now to put on a bit of information around the potential or likely uh, sanctions for that kind of offence. Right down at the bottom, you will also be able to see uh, case documents. And this is where we upload on the system any evidence that has been used in raising the charge. And you will also be able to download the formal notification letter. So if you click on that, you will see uh, it basically contains all of the same information, but in the more traditional uh, letter format that those who have been involved for a few years will have remembered previously re receiving through the post every couple of weeks. Again, just gives details of the, the match, um, the, the person that's been charged, their charge, um, and the details around that. Scrolling down, uh, it gives you a paper form if you wish, which uh, will allow you to respond to the charge and tick how you are pleading. Um, and then on the final page, probably the most important part and why it would be always be worth downloading the, uh, the charge letter for every case is so that you can see the referee report. On this one, appreciate it, I just um, put in something very basic, um, but this will be the report that's been submitted through to the county by the referee and we'll have as many, much detail as they've put in it. This instance, uh, we just put that having been sent off, BBFA demo, adult male, knock the cards out of my hands. And again, knocking the cards out of the hands would be considered an act of physical contact on a match official. If we go back into the case on whole game, um, it shows that hasn't been responded to yet. So for every misconduct charge, we, we need to know whether you accept the charge or deny it. So whether you agree with what we've said and what's been raised or whether you refute it. And um, if you would like to deal with the case purely by correspondence or you would like to attend a personal hearing. So if I click on to respond, first of all, I'll ask you, I'm pleading guilty or not guilty. And then it will ask you to um, say if you request a personal hearing or a non-personal hearing. Regardless of whether you're going personal or non-personal, um, you can attach documents, uh, so any statements in response to the charge that you may wish to be considered uh, through the browse and upload function. And if you are going to a personal hearing, then we would probably just ask that you add the name of any witness that will be attending so that we're prepared when we coordinate these hearings to make sure that we give enough time um, to consider the charge and to allow all witnesses to present their evidence. Click to sign the terms and conditions and then hit submit. If you have requested a personal hearing, um, it will then tell you that there is an outstanding balance of £45 that needs to be paid. And if you go back um, and that can then be paid uh, through the normal kind of channels, so through bank transfer or through the whole game system as well. And that is where you can find uh, the display on the whole game system. Just to talk for a little bit now around the disciplinary commission and hearing process. Um, so what happens once you've responded to us? Um, generally, there'll be a couple of weeks between a response being submitted and you finding out the results. If it, if you requested it be dealt with by correspondence. Um, equally, if you respond that you want a personal hearing, we'll be getting in touch with you pretty quickly to start coordinating that, arranging dates um, and arranging any witnesses that may need to attend. Either way, every single case that is charged by County FA must be considered by a disciplinary commission. The charge in itself is not the outcome. Um, you will always have that opportunity to present any evidence in response to it. And it's only once we have all of that together that a panel will decide whether they believe it is proven or not proven. Panel um, will generally consist of four individuals, a chair, two wing members and a secretary, every one of which will have gone through specialist FA training. Some of the more serious cases that are dealt with now um, by the FA national panel will be considered now by a chair sitting alone, um, but those are only generally the exceptional cases. 
So for every hearing that we hold here at the county, at least one voting member must be independent, so must hold no formal role within the county FA. So cannot be a council member, board member, um, certainly would never be a staff member, but somebody that ha has to be somebody that doesn't have a, a formal elected position within the county. And we always make sure that the panel members have sent the case papers in advance of the hearing. That's to make sure that A, everything runs as quickly and smoothly as can at the hearing itself, but also means that you know that they've had that opportunity to really consider all of the evidence that's been presented. For the non-personal cases, we hold weekly correspondence hearings online uh, so that those can be considered and we'll generally look at um, around eight cases a week probably, anywhere from six to ten depending if they're related or not, um, to make sure again we're we're keeping everything running uh, quick, as quickly and smoothly as we can. That also means if you request a case be heard by correspondence, you should probably have a uh, result back within two weeks or so of the response being submitted, depending on our caseload at the time. The personal hearings normally take a little bit longer to coordinate just because of the number of people involved, and we are required to give 14 days notice of any hearing. So again, it's probably about, um, I'd say on average, about a month between a response coming in to a personal hearing and um, that hearing it's itself actually going ahead. For the decision making process, uh, hearings are inquisitorial and not adversarial. Um, and the burden is on the county FA as the, the body bringing the charge to prove it. That's not to say that we have someone that stands up and presents the case and argues for it to be found proven. As we said, it's not adversarial. It's not the county versus the player and it's not the referee versus the player. It's inquisitorial. So we, as the county, present the evidence um, and it is the responsibility of the panel to question that evidence, whether it's through actually questioning individuals that provided witness statements and are attending a personal hearing or by critically analysing the written evidence that's been provided to them. And the Commission must be satisfied that the alleged offence occurred on the balance of probability. So do they believe it is more likely than not that that offence was committed? It's the same threshold no matter what the level of, of offence. So it's still effectively a 51-49 split, gut feeling yes it's more likely than not that it happens, whether we're talking about um, you know, abusive language from one player to another, all the way up to an assault charge. Um, and that is deemed to be the appropriate civil burden of proof um, for these kinds of offences. For personal hearings, uh, we will always hear the county FA evidence first. So that will generally be the match officials or it may be any other witnesses who have provided statements in advance. What we cannot do as the county FA is we cannot introduce new evidence that the person being charged has not already had the opportunity to witness. Again, that is um, a question of fairness. It is not fair for them to have to uh, respond to new evidence on the night and not have that opportunity to consider and analyse that evidence in advance. The defence then provide their evidence. So the individual that's been charged will give their account of what happened and uh, they are allowed to bring any supporting witnesses they deem appropriate, and they are allowed to introduce new evidence on the night because it is uh, their right to defend themselves to the best of their abilities. At each step of those, any witness that attends, whether it's the match official, the individual that's been charged, or any supporting witnesses either way, uh, can be questioned by the disciplinary panel and can be questioned by the individual that's been charged or someone acting as their representative. And then at the end of the hearing, uh, the individual that's been charged has the opportunity to provide a closing statement. So they have the final uh, say in their defence for the charge that's been issued against them. At that stage, the panel will be asked to decide liability. So whether they think it's proven or not proven based on that balance of probability. If it's not proven, that is the ending of the proceedings and we will cancel the charge on the system, uh, refund any expenses that have already gone out and uh, there is no record kept on that individual's or club's permanent record. If it is proven, however, we will review that uh, participant's disciplinary record, whether it's the player or the club, 
um, over the far past five seasons, and they have the opportunity to enter a plea for leniency uh, to try and keep any sanctions down as low as possible. At that stage, the disciplinary panel will make a decision as to what sanction they will impose. Just to talk about a couple of other terms that may crop up when looking at personal hearings or things that to throw spanner in the works. Um, mentioned earlier that if there are cases involving clubs from other counties, we work with them. Um, equally, if there are multiple cases from the same game um, relating to different teams, we will always make sure that those cases are heard together at the same time in what we call consolidated proceedings. Reason for that is that the evidence from one case may impact whether another case is proven or not proven because the facts of the case are so intertwined. Therefore, all individuals who have been charged should have the opportunity to um, respond to all evidence that is provided. So in those cases, any defendant that's requested a personal hearing has the opportunity to question all witnesses and each other uh, throughout the process. Mentioned earlier that individuals have the right to be represented um, and that can be a legal representation. Uh, we just ask that we're notified in advance if that's going to be the case. Um, and the, but that representative can also just be somebody else from within the club. Um, so it could be a club secretary representing a player, maybe a member of a referees association representing a referee if they've been charged with an offence. But the individual that's been charged must always still be present and must respond to any questions of them as a witness. Um, they cannot, it, we cannot deal with the case in their absence because ultimately they're the one that's been uh, charged. They're the one that has to be satisfied that they've had every opportunity to defend themselves to the best of their abilities. Equally, a representative cannot act as a witness. And the reason for that is they've had the opportunity to hear all of the other witness statements. Therefore, any of their own evidence um, could be prejudiced by what they've already heard. We can, however, have a, a written statement from them prepared in advance. Finally, um, mentioned as well earlier that aggravated breaches will be, uh, we will provide written reasons for them. And that actually has now extended across serious offences against match officials and individuals. So, um, these are generally considered the most serious kinds of cases we deal with. So it's anything involving potentially discriminatory language. Any act of physical contact, uh, threatening behaviour or assault on a match official or any assault uh, between two different players. And any um, instance where there's a suspension of over 10 matches and heard by personal hearing, we will produce written reasons to explain how and why we came to that decision and have imposed such a significant penalty. Again, that's all done on the aim of fairness to all parties um, and consistency across the country and transparency across the network. That applies um, whether the charge is not proven or proven. So it's also important for us to be able to say that if we've had an allegation come through of physical contact on a match official that ultimately is not proven, we, th we believe that there's a responsibility to go back to the referee and be able to say to them, this is why the charge has not been proven and no sanctions have been imposed. Equally, there are mandatory minimum sanctions for certain offences to ensure we have that consistency across the country, ranging from um, standard ones of 112 days or 182 days um, for offences against match officials, up to five to 10 years for acts of assault. Um, and then they have mandatory minimums, which a panel cannot go below. So therefore, if you have a player that's been charged with physical contact on a match official, you should not ex you should not see a suspension shorter than 84 days. Equally, um, down at the bottom, you'll see the uh, offence of a first aggravated breach will always carry a mandatory minimum sanction now of six matches and £75. Again, that's to reflect the severity of those kinds of charges. Um, sensitivity of them and kind of the profile of the those kinds of offences uh, in football at the moment. So you should be seeing consistent sanctions um, across the entire country for those kinds of offences.
Now it's rare, but occasionally we do need to take out that action against a young person or uh, ask them to um, be a witness to a charge that may have been raised. Um, so I want to touch around the kind of provisions we put in place to safeguard young people through the disciplinary process. So the minimum age to attend a hearing is 14 years old um, and any witness um, under the age of 18 participating in youth football must be accompanied at a personal hearing by what we call a responsible adult. So generally a parent or a club representative, someone that um, is there effectively as a, as a safety net and moral support. They shouldn't be taking an active role in the hearing, but they will be, um, be sat with that young person throughout just to make sure that they feel comfortable. And indeed, if there are, if they do have concerns either um, for the well-being of the, the individual involved or around what is happening, we will work with them to make sure that those are taken into account. What I would say is uh, new regulations come in for this season, which is that players aged 14 to 16 um, must now or can only now attend a hearing remotely. Um, even once we come out of lockdown and are back in a, the position where we can have personal hearings in person rather than across uh, the, the internet, um, players aged 14 to 16 will still attend remotely um, with a parent sat by their side. We also make sure that in those situations uh, when a, someone under the age of 18 is involved that only the chair will interact with them. We do this again to avoid them feeling like they are on trial, even if they're only providing a witness statement, perhaps if it's a 16 year old referee, let's say, um, and to avoid any feeling they may have of intimidation with any uh, any indiv other individuals have been charged or acting as witnesses. So the chair will try and make it as conversational as possible and deal with them very much on a one on one, -on -one basis. If there's a 16 or 17 year old um, that's been either charged with an offence or is acting as a witness for an incident in adult football, we will generally treat them as an adult. Um, but if there are any concerns around their well-being or their um, their comfort in attending a hearing, we will make sure that we adopt those kind of uh, young person procedures. Ultimately, the, the motto we have is that they are a child first and a football participant second. So therefore, it's most important to us that we act according to their needs based on their age, rather than any end goal we have in trying to um, force them into to a situation they may not be comfortable with. So going forward, um, I always like to try and conclude these uh, sessions with some practical advice to clubs. I um, appreciate you've listened to me recite regulations, procedures and um, everything else this evening. But these are probably the most important takeaways, things you can do on a practical basis week in, week out. So the first um, advice I would give is that if we come to you saying that um, an incident happens or that um, we need your observations on something, or if you've been at a game and you've seen an incident happen uh, that you know we're going to come asking for observations, uh, is to start an internal investigation. So speak to any witnesses you may have within the club, uh, the managers, the players that have been involved, and ask them to provide you with statements. Share that evidence um, and explain the options if a charge is raised. So if a charge is raised against one of your players, um, make sure they're aware of all of the statements that have been provided against them and explain the options that are available to them. Ultimately, this is critical is be honest about what happens um, and try and take, it can be difficult, I appreciate, but try and take that step back and look at an incident objectively. Poor referee performance may be mitigation as to why a manager was frustrated at the time, but that does not uh, excuse the fact that they may have hurled a barrage of insults at them and therefore does not invalidate a charge that actually, yes, they still used abusive language towards the referee. Equally, if all of your players and officials get involved in a mass confrontation, chances are that the club failed to control them or failed to ensure they conducted themselves appropriately. Therefore, yes, you'll still likely get the charge, but you can present the mitigation as to 
what maybe sparked that incident um, and what steps you've taken since to ensure it doesn't happen again or what steps you took at the time to try and take control of the situation. If you do opt to go for a uh, personal hearing, um, please, please, please prepare. Um, I say this as someone that sat in several hundred uh, hearings of various types now over the last five years. It's frustrating, uh, as uh, even as an impartial, neutral observer to this, to the uh, hearing, when people have requested a hearing and turn up without a single question for any of the witnesses that have been called. You will do yourself the best justice you can and you will put yourself in the best position by preparing properly. Um, you know that the referee is going to be there and uh, you know it's likely that anybody else that's provided a statement will be there or you at least have the opportunity to comment about anything you disagree with in a somebody else's statement. So prepare those and um, come prepared for what witnesses may be attending, what questions you would like to ask or what um, what concerns or what, uh, what you dispute within statements that have been provided. We have a whole list of resources available on our website. Um, the link is on the page there, um, but can be provided uh, if you want to drop us an email at any time. And we talk through um, all of those different types of charges. So the aggravated charges, alternate um, things. That we, we look at the different processes for consolidated hearings, how personal hearings work. And we've got guides for all the different people that may be attending one of those. So we're trying to make sure that the resources are available um, and we will always send out any relevant guides ahead of a hearing so that uh, the club's able to prepare before attending. Equally, if you do have any questions at any time, um, then please do contact us. We can never really tell you whether you should, how you should respond, whether you should be uh, accepting or denying a charge and whether you should be going for a personal or a correspondence hearing but we can always provide advice around the different processes um, and what things you may need to take into consideration. Equally, we may not be able to provide you with uh, a full explanation about how a panel has come to a decision after, after a case has been considered. But again, we will um, try and help you navigate why, it may, why they may have come to a decision they have um, and what your options may be for any potential appeal to a decision that's been made. We also have previous sessions such as this now um, available on our YouTube channel. Um, we've got about 15 probably club seminars such as this, looking at various different roles within football and various different processes. So please take a look through there and we'll keep adding to those throughout the course of the season. We've got more sessions planned in 2021, looking at things like uh, player registration and volunteer recruitment, uh, internal club discipline and managing complaints, um, welfare situations within the clubs. So we're going to keep putting these kinds of resources available out there. And if there's anything that we haven't covered um, and that you would like to see us covering, uh, then please let us know because we're, we're here to try and help you as the clubs. Um, more than happy to, to put on any kind of resources that can help. But beyond that, that is the end of the session this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. 